Toilet trivia to keep you entertained. Everyone defecates, and it's almost always in a toilet. But it wasn't always such a splendid, alone activity. In some regions, it used to be a strange collective thing, while in others, it was pig food. So, how did we get from defecating in public to sitting pleasantly on a work of art? Today, we'll take a look at the evolution of toilets. But, before we settle in, subscribe to the Could Be Anything channel and let us know what modern luxuries you'd want to learn more about. Let's go talk to a dude about a horse now. Around 2500 BCE, the first toilet was invented. In northern India and Pakistan, the first known toilet and sewer system appeared in 2500 BC. Houses in the Indus Valley may theoretically mention a bathroom in the home description, with rooms allocated specifically to numbers 1 and 2, and occasionally 3. These rooms had drain pipes leading to a central sewage system that could be flushed by simply pouring water down the toilet. So far, it sounds like a relatively familiar procedure. So yet, nothing strange has happened. Sewage was carried through a basic grid system in brick and terracotta pipes, or all of the components required to construct a house in Florida. This allowed waste to be conveyed from many levels of the house and discharged in the nearest body of water, which is now known as Florida. These pipes were very sophisticated, with utility holes leading from the street to the main drainage line and wooden screens put into the drainage line's ends to block solid waste. Both of them were designed to make sewage maintenance as simple and unobtrusive as feasible. While many aspects of this ancient infrastructure are very similar to what we use today. Western societies would have to wait thousands of years to catch up with this sanitary system. Toilets filled with sand are used by ancient Egyptians. It's only fitting that the Egyptians used a restroom in the shape of a cat for a society that worshipped cats. Ancient Egyptian toilets were created with the goal of conserving water. They were adamant about conserving water, believing that it should only be used with the intention of reusing it. Egyptians would throw water onto themselves during bath time because they didn't have running water in their dwellings, even if they had specialized bathing facilities. The water was collected in jars and reused for agriculture and farming. The Egyptian 1% would perch their opulent behinds on limestone chairs to waste themselves into sand-filled pots that would be cleaned out by attendants, or what we now refer to as having a cat. Lower plebeian class members would also discharge themselves in sand holes. However, instead of a more magnificent, non-splintery limestone, their poor garbage butts had to settle for a dumb wooden seat with a hole carved in the middle. What a shambles for a shambles. China's Han Dynasty has big toilets. If you weren't hungry before viewing this video, you will be afterward, especially for a bacon snack. Farmers built toilets that were immediately fed back into their pig pens during the Han Dynasty in China. There was one minor distinction between these toilets and a typical outhouse. Instead of going into a hole in the ground, the excrement went into a hole in a pig's face. The trash was sent to the pig pen, where it was consumed as a light snack by the pigs. Once digested, the waste from this human feces, which has been converted to pig waste, will be used as fertilizer, obviating the requirement for a sanitation system. Cowards, include that in a section from the circle of life. Easy to flush latrines were built by the Romans. The idea of socializing in a Roman restroom appealed to me. Their restrooms were made up of long stone or wooden benches with holes strewn around enabling users to do their business while sitting comfortably. To make it easier to flush the water through the city's sewage system, these bench toilets were designed to float one to two feet above the ground. There were no partitions between the bench holes, making going to the restroom more of a social activity than a private time. The troughs beneath the toilets were flushed with running water from Rome's aqueducts. While it was an excellent way to get rid of garbage, it was also a horrible way to avoid rodent attacks from open sewage lines and occasional fires caused by methane buildup. When it comes to old toilet systems, though, you win some and lose some. However, a swarm of prospective rats on fire will almost certainly result in a loss. Glorified chutes were the castle toilets. The majority of the heavy lifting of transporting waste to a more suitable location away from the castle was done by the magical force of gravity in medieval castle toilets. Castles were outfitted with rooms committed to answering nature's call. However, they were referred to as garderobes rather than restrooms. Garderobes were nothing special, with only a few bells and whistles. The simple garderobe was a small room with chutes leading to a communal cesspit or moat where the feces might float away or around the castle. If the purpose of the moat is to keep adversaries out of the castle, floating poo as a disincentive for crossing would be a good addition. Chamber pots. 
Most people had to go down to local cesspools to relieve themselves before indoor flushing toilets became widespread in the 20th century, which was a pretty nifty inconvenience for something where convenience is essential. At night, this might be a potentially dangerous journey. People would have chamber pots in the room instead of marching down to a wonderful sounding local cesspool. Chamber pots were little metal or ceramic vessels used to hold garbage that were later poured into pools or just thrown out the window, undoubtedly a fun thing to hunt for when strolling beneath a window. They remained a common method of going to the bathroom until World War II, and they are still used in some regions of the world where indoor plumbing is not available. People weren't afraid to jazz up chamber pots, turning them into less of a pot to piss in and more of a fun little house ornament to whiz in, because they were a common feature in people's homes. Some were elegant and constructed of exquisite china or pottery. Others were housed in ornamental boxes. Some had verses like, use me well and keep me clean, and I'll not disclose what I've seen, which has now been simplified to simply, live, laugh, love. In the 16th century the modern flushable toilet was invented. Sir John Harrington was a provocative poet and political writer known for his risque poems. In the late 16th century, he also constructed a flush toilet, as one does when writing poetry. Harrington characterized the contraption in the Metamorphosis of Ajax as an elevated cistern that emptied water into the toilet bowl and removed waste by a chain or what sounds eerily similar to a modern-day toilet. Sadly, the Metamorphosis of Ajax was also a carefully veiled attack against the English government. So, for nearly two centuries, the invention of a toilet was likely tossed away with the bathwater, sandwiched amid critiques of the monarchy. Queen Elizabeth I, on the other hand, had one built for her, which is certainly not the point Harrington was trying to make with his anti-government track. In 18th century they refined the flush toilet. It wasn't until the mid-18th century that the flushable toilet began to gain popularity. The innovative plumbing equipment that assisted in the invention of the modern-day flushing toilet was invented by Scottish inventor Alexander Cumming and English inventor John Brahma. The S-trap was invented by Cumming to allow water to sit in the bowl and act as a barrier against the nasty odors of sewage and gas, as well as a popular source of drinking water for bad dogs. Despite the fact that Harrington was the first to invent the toilet, Cumming retained the patent. Brahm invented a valve with a hinged flap that sealed the water in the bowl during the installation of Cumming's design. These babies began selling like hotcakes thanks to these two advancements in toilet design, with water closets gaining in popularity during the mid-18th and 19th centuries. Following World War I, all new buildings in the United Kingdom were required to have an indoor toilet. We've come a long way since we threw our feces out the window. Famous for selling flushing toilets Thomas Crapper. Thomas Crapper is frequently mistakenly credited as the inventor of the modern toilet because of his last name and how amusing and ironic that would be. In truth, Crapper was more akin to the toilet rock band Kiss. He didn't develop the toilet, but he certainly understood how to promote it. Crapper, an early sanitation pioneer, is credited with designing the strangely attractive U-Bend piping system. The trap is still in use today in toilets and sinks. Crapper tried to sell his sanitation concepts to the wealthy by displaying his toilet items in showrooms. Crapper did not invent the flushing toilet, by the way. But he didn't go out of his way to correct them when they came to the wrong conclusion. What's the point of ruining it? This was a better option. His renown grew after Edward VII hired him to create dozens of indoor bathrooms in different royal residences. But, of course, it was largely because his last name was Crapper and his entire existence revolved on toilets. Pay-per-use toilet for public. The notion of establishing public flush toilets around London was first recommended by George Jennings, a sanitation engineer and creator of the Otour toilet. In 1851, Jennings designed a series of penny-per-use toilets for use in an art show. Jennings' pay-to-use art toilets were a tremendous hit, especially with the poorest people who couldn't afford a flush toilet but could pay a penny to use one. With these toilets proving to be a huge success, Jennings proposed building public restrooms in London's Royal Exchange, a significant commerce and business district. The government first dismissed this proposal, arguing that no one would want a public restroom and that the results of multiple trial public restrooms revealed them to be false. The Royal Society of Arts, which funded Jennings' public toilets at the art show, soon after put a few test pay toilets around London to determine if it was something people desired. Even if the move's heart was in the right place, it ended up being a financial disaster. Several years after Jennings' death, London officials ultimately came around to Jennings' concept in 1885. The first facilities were created at the Royal Exchange, but not by Jennings' firm, which appears to be a jerkish move on the part of the Royal Exchange. To help fight cholera dry toilets were invented. 
Because of the pervasive filthy circumstances, contagious diseases spread like wildfire as the population grew. Cholera, in particular, was the contagious disease of the day, and its spread was facilitated tremendously by inadequate sanitation. As a result, the dry toilet was created as a way to use the bathroom without using water to flush. Rather, it would redirect waste or absorb the liquid with a covering substance such as peat. With a patent issued in 1873, an English clergyman called Henry Moore was able to get the design into schools and public hospitals in England and India. Despite the fact that his concept reduced maintenance costs and eliminated the odors associated with sewage systems, it did not catch on. Today, we owe all of our moist toilets to this incompetence. So, what are your thoughts? Are you watching this video from the comfort of your toilet? We're sure you are. Please wash your hands before watching any of the other great videos on our Could Be Anything channel.